County after Dallas County Sheriff. Uh, yes, thank you. We got it. Okay. In March 1965, shortly after Dallas County Sheriff Jim Clark and his deputies violently broke up a civil rights march on the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama, President Lyndon Johnson spoke to Congress and the nation about why America had to act to guarantee to all Americans the right to vote, ending his speech with, and we shall overcome. The previous year, uh, Republican Minority Leader Everett Dirksen had broken the Southern filibuster of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, stating, quote, there is nothing so powerful as an idea whose time has come. What became the Voting Rights Act was sponsored in the Senate jointly by both majority and minority leadership. It took five months for the bill to clear the Senate, the House and the Joint Conference Committee to reconcile the House and Senate versions. And Lyndon Johnson signed it on, in uh, August 6, 1965. Johnson, uh, it relied on the 15th Amendment to end voting and election discrimination by outlawing certain practices. And I'm going to read very quickly the 15th Amendment. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. That's section one. Section two, the Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. <laughs> The Voting Rights Act authorized federal agents to register voters and oversee elections in those states and districts, the Attorney General or the federal court and district in DC, uh, where, pardon me, they do oversee elections in those states where such discrimination was most egregious. In those states and districts, the Attorney General or the federal court in DC had to approve any new or altered rules relating to voting and electoral requirements, practices, and procedures before they could take effect. This was called pre-clearance. Interestingly, during the Constitutional Convention back in 1870, 1877 and 1887-88, the issue, the issue had come up, should the new federal government have the power to oversee state legislation. And the delegates unanimously voted no on that. <clears throat> Congress amended the Voting Rights Act and extended its pre-clearance requirements a number of times, in 1970, in 1975, and in 1982, and lastly in, 1980, in 2006. Yet in 2013, in Shelby County versus Holder, the Supreme Court gutted the Voting Rights Act by holding the pre-clearance provisions unconstitutional. Now, I'm going to start with the history of suffrage from colonial times to 1965. Then I'll cover the Voting Rights Act, how the Supreme Court and Congress dealt with it up to 2013 when the Shelby County case was decided, a close examination of that case, and I'm going to end with a recent case that was decided just this past March. And I'll give you a spoiler alert. It's not pretty. <laughs> <laughs> Until the early 20th century, only men could vote. And for much of American history, that meant white men. And until the 1830s and 40s, that meant white men with property. In the 1870s, in the 1760s, in Great Britain and her colonies, only male freeholders could vote. A freeholder, and I put that word in quotes, is a male with property. The rationale was that the crown, that is the state, received taxes voluntarily as agreed by those paying them through their elected representatives. And most taxes were property taxes and customs duties on luxury goods. Now it's an axiom that those with the power make the rules. They, the men who paid the taxes and owned property, believe that suffrage should be limited to those men who had skin in the game and interest in the country. Elite leaders argued that those with property who had the responsibility and permanence necessary for participation. Women, children, servants, property-less men were dependents. As such, they didn't allegedly did not have a direct interest in the state. And as further justification, it was assumed that men with property were better educated and wiser. And property qualifications kept the vote away from the have-nots who would support, quote, leveling, backing populists who would pander to the underclass by promising them value taken from those with property. 
Now, the biggest difference between Britain and her American colonies was that in Britain, the population was large and the vast majority of land was owned, owned by the few, the aristocrats and the landed gentry. But in Britain's mainland colonies, the population was comparatively small and vacant land was virtually unlimited or vacant in the sense that it wasn't occupied by white Anglo-Saxons. In Britain, only about 10% of adult males could vote, while in the several colonies, close to 40% of adult males would meet the property qualifications and could vote. In May 1776, the Second Continental Congress voted for independence and advised the colonies to replace their royal charters with state constitutions. Most did so over the next decade, and they invariably carried over their rules of property qualifications for voting. John Adams wrote that the people's consent provided the only moral foundation for government. But to Adams, the people didn't include everyone. Women, children, servants, people without property, paupers, were too little acquainted with public affairs to quote his words, judge rightly, close quote, and too dependent on other men to have a will of their own. Even ardent Democrat Thomas Jefferson understood that voters were men who, quote, fight and pay, close quote. Now, the 1787 convention that wrote our Constitution was no hotbed of democratic fervor. Our founding fathers decided that the president and vice president would be elect selected by an electoral college whose members were picked by state legislatures. <clears throat> And the state legislatures also selected each state's two senators. Only the House was democratically elected. Now, the delegates to the, the Constitutional Convention agreed that only freeholders should vote, but there was no national standard. Each colony, now state, had developed its own rules for who could vote, and there was no agreement for creating a national standard. Rather than try, the delegates left suffrage up to each state. Members of the House of Representatives would be chosen by those in their respective states who were entitled to vote for the, quote, more numerous branch of their state legislature. And that's ingrained in Article 1, Section 2. The House of Representatives shall be, com members shall be composed of members chosen every second year by the people of the several states and the electors, meaning the, who could vote, of in each state shall have the qualifications requisite for electors of the most numerous branch of the state legislature, which means if you could vote for the lower house in your state, you could vote for an, in a national election. But if you couldn't, then you couldn't vote. <clears throat> the, by 1810, not much had changed, although some states expressed the qualification in terms of paying taxes as opposed to owning a set amount of property. But the idea remained that not every man could vote. A certain amount of snobbishness was involved. The hoi polloi shouldn't be, shouldn't and couldn't be trusted to vote wisely. Uh, and let me go to the next slide. There's no better example of this than say a line of thinking than James Kent's argument against expanding suffrage during New York's 1821 state constitutional convention to rewrite the state constitution. And he says, by the report before us, we propose to annihilate, annihilate at one stroke all those property distinctions and bow before the idol, the idol of universal suffrage. That extreme democratic principle has been regarded with terror by the wise men of every age, because in every European republic, ancient and modern, in which it has been tried, it has terminated disastrously and been productive of corruption, injustice, violence, and tyranny. The experiment of universal suffrage is too mighty an excitement for the moral constitution of men to endure. And the history of every state proves it. There is a tendency in the, of the poor to covet a share in the plunder of the rich, and the debtor to relax and avoid the obligation of contracts, and the majority to tyrannize over the minority and trample down their rights, and the indolent and the profligate to cast the whole burdens of society upon the industrious and the virtuous, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. By the way, Kent lost. Uh, the New York drastically reduced property qualifications for adult white males. Yet the American Revolution, oops, I just goofed there. Let me go back. Play from current slide, okay. Yet the American Revolution had unleashed a political awakening in ordinary people. 
Starting in the 1820s, the political realities of westward expansion and the development of party politics and the corresponding need to garner support from the, from the electorate augured for change. So political participation exploded. And this is reflected by voter turnout. In the 1870s, it was about 10 to 12%. By 1796, about 50%. But from the 1820s to the remainder of the 19th century, over 75% of eligible voters constantly turned out to vote in presidential elections. By the way, the two thirds turnout in 2020 was the largest in over hundred years. So turnout you know, was, was tremendous, although voting, the right to vote was somewhat limited. Now the rise of Andrew Jackson's populism in the 1820s increased pressure to expand the franchise. Those opposed to eliminating property qualifications were accused of being aristocrats, seeking to protect their privileges by limiting the number of eligible voters. So we see that state after state expanded white male suffrage. Uh, and we see this here in, in two, if you compare the two maps, in 1800, the vast majority of states had property qualifications, four of them had, had uh, taxpayer qualifications, and only Vermont, Kentucky, and Tennessee provided for universal white ma uh, male suffrage. You switch to 1830 and the, the map has con considerably changed. The number of states gone to who have adopted universal white male suffrage had expanded tremendously. Uh, most states had eliminated property qualifications. They were retained only in North Carolina. And uh, an equal number of states substituted them for tax qualifications. And most of those tax qualifications were set very low. If you either paid the poll tax or worked an hour a month on the roads in, this, in your area, you were considered a voter. So even though there was a tax paying qualification, it was, it was, it was very slim. We see, and we see, here's another one. We see that, uh, that you see the, the, the map going, the graph shifting. The number of uh, universal suffrage and the number of states rose tremendously by 1855, yet the number of states uh, with uh, property qualifications go, goes down to a minimum as, as does tax paying requirements. But, and here's a but, at the same time uh, that white male, had, white, uh, male suffrage was expanding, that the race became a defining issue. In 1790, only four of the 13 states specifically barred African-Americans from voting. By 1855, only five New England states allowed black men to vote, while the other 26 states limited suffrage to adult white males. Now, expanding white male suffrage transformed the nature of American politics, both organizationally and ideologically. Political parties became fixtures. Organized parties nominated candidates and mobilized voters. Wealthy candidates played down their wealth and status. Both Democrats and Whigs celebrated ordinary farmers, artisans, and even laborers as, quote, producers, close quote, who were entitled to equal opportunity as a matter of right. And, if, and I can't have every example illustrated, but if you ever want to go online and look up William Henry Harrison, uh, who was the, a log cabin candidate uh, with a jug of liquor and sitting in front of a log cabin. The reality was he had a rather large mansion and was a slaveholder and had about 75 slaves working his land. <clears throat> but all this applied only to white men. Women and children were deemed dependent whose interests were represented by their husbands, fathers, and adult brothers. All but a few New England states excluded non-whites. Slaves were deemed property with no rights whatsoever. Non-enslaved blacks were an unwanted underclass with no right to participate in political decisions. And Indians weren't even considered Americans. They were considered members of semi-autonomous dependent tribes. And most whites wished they would simply disappear. <clears throat> and you saw in 1832 was actually the first of the Indian Removal Acts, which forcibly removed the tribes uh, out of the out of uh, what were the more Anglo settled areas. And you, the result, of course, was the Trail of Tears. Now, voting had always been a public event with votes registered orally. 
What we know is the secret ballot, where all ballots look alike, so the voters' preferences remain secret, were not adopted in the United States until the 1880s. Campaigns and elections were social community events, marching bands, parades, day-long gatherings filled with speeches from all sides. Election day was party time. I noticed the guy in the lower left-hand side here. Political parties and their candidates provided voters with free food and booze. When Stephen Field, who Lincoln would appoint to the Supreme Court in 1862, ran for the California State Assembly from a mining camp in 1851, his largest campaign expense was a $350 bar bill to, 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 to stand drinks for the men who came to town to vote on election day. Blue laws that banned alcoholic beverages at or near polling places came much later. Now the Civil War saw a further expansion. So many men were in the field that most of the Northern states, 19 of them, for the first time allowed servicemen to vote by absentee ballot. If you remember in the Civil War, there were 36 states, but 11 of them withdrew uh, to join the Confederacy and three state states, Delaware, Kentucky, and Maryland remained in the Union. So that's uh, 14. Uh, of the other 21 states, 19 of them allowed absentee ballots. Lincoln rode to re-election in 1864 on the Union soldiers' vote. If the men in the field had not been allowed to vote, McClellan and the Democratic Party's peace, peace plan should, would have won. Think about that. If those 19 states had not, uh, had not allowed absentee ballots for the first time to, so their union, so their men in uniform could vote, the results of our history would be substantially different. An example of contingency. Immediately after Civil War, after the Civil War, the former Confederate states reacted to emancipation by funding other means to maintain a system of forced labor. Most of them enacted what, are, what they call black codes that required former slaves to be employed or be found guilty of vagrancy and then forced to work off fines for months at a time. Landowners were encouraged to offer only year-long contracts, which were made enforceable by law and made a crime for a, for a, a, a former slave to, to leave. Now, the Republican-controlled Congress responded to the Black Codes in 1866 and 67 by the Reconstruction Acts, which divided the former 11 Confederate states into military districts under army control. And Congress would not allow senators or representatives from those states to take their seats in Congress unless they met certain requirements. Those requirements, requirements included adopting a new state constitution that abolished slavery, that acknowledged that the Union was perpetual, and that ratified the 13th and 14th Amendments. Now, they had to hold conventions to write new constitutions, and the terms that were imposed were that adult Black men were permitted to vote for the delegates that would do so. So these early Reconstruction constitutions uh, that were adopted by the Southern states between 1868 and 1874 apply, you know, many of them allowed for Black suffrage. Now, the Republican-controlled Congress wanted Black men to have a vote. They wanted their votes. They assumed they'd vote Republican, and they were right. To encourage Black suffrage, they added Section 2 to the 14th Amendment. Now, this section reduced the state's representation in the House proportionally to the number of adult males not permitted to vote. But it, it had never been enforced, and the Republicans in control of Congress wanted more, and in February 1867, Congress proposed the 15th Amendment. Quote, the right to vote citizens to vote shall not be abridged or denied on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. And like the 14th and 15th Amendments, it gave Congress the power of enforcement. It was ratified by the requisite three-fourths of the states and effective as of March 30th, 1870. Section 2 of the 14th Amendment had never been enforced. By the way, a little note, California never ratified either the 14th or 15th Amendment when it mattered due to statewide opposition to extending rights to Chinese immigrants. It had nothing to do with African Americans. There were very few Blacks in California at that time, but they, there was a groundswell of opposition to Chinese immigrants. And California's legislature finally got around to ratifying the 14th Amendment in 1959 and the 15th in 1962. A little bit of trivia for you. <laughs>
By the mid 1870s, mainly in the many in the North were fed up with Reconstruction. And it's obvious when we compare drawings by illustrators and cartoonists for Harper's Weekly between 1867 and those appearing in the late 1870s. And here, here's three examples. Uh, in, 18, in, in November 1867, they are uh, uh, celebrating the first vote. Uh, and then we see in 1874, colored rule in a reconstructed state. And in 1876, on the 1876 presidential election, the ignorant vote uh, uh, honors are easy. And you have the Irish vote in the North compared to, to the African-American vote in the South. And just the difference in the way the characterization just speaks volumes. Reconstruction state governments were seen as both incompetent and corrupt. The nation, which is the U.S. was the U.S. at its time, and which had been staunchly pro-union and anti-slavery, editorialized that quote: "Governments of trashy whites and ignorant Negroes were among the worst ever seen in civilized society." Close quote. Racial prejudice and social Darwinism had a lot to do with it. By the 1870s, many Northern whites came to doubt that former slaves could ever be culturally and socially equal. The Atlantic Monthly, which reflected upscale Northern values, it was an intellectual magazine, it was the New Yorker of its time, had supported abolition before the war and had supported ratification of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments in the early years of Reconstruction. But in 1879, its editor wrote that it was, quote, quixotic, close quote, to expect Southern Blacks to rise to the level of white society. Quote, we have almost as much chance to change the average Negro into an intelligent citizen in white society as incorporating the Indian into our government by teaching him basic grammar, close quote. And Henry Francis Parkman, who was a history professor at Harvard in the late 1870s and was deemed the eminent historian of his time, uh, published an article in the, in the, in the New, New England Review in 1878, comparing an, a New England village of olden time, when, quote, some 40 years ago, it would have been safely and well governed by the votes of every man in it. But now the village has grown into a populous city with its factories and workshops, its acres of tenement houses and thousands and 10,000 of restless workmen foreigners for the most part, to whom liberty means license and politics means plunder, to whom the public good is nothing and their most trivial interests everything, who love the country for what they can get out of it and whose ears are open to the promptings of every rascally agitator, close quote. Uh, and then he adds on that universal suffrage becomes a questionable blessing, close quote. So this is the attitude of the time. In the 1876 election, the most disputed until Bush versus Gore in 2000, it was finally resolved only a few weeks before the winner was inaugurated. It was actually not resolved until uh, the last week in February of 1877 by a deal. And the, if, you, if anybody who studied history, uh, New York Governor Tilden, the Democrat, won the majority of the popular vote, uh, but 18 electoral votes were disputed and a commission, and there's a whole story in this, ultimately awarded them to Rutherford B. Hayes, which gave the Republicans the win by one, by one electoral vote. And the deal that was made that resolved it because the country was literally up in arms, it was almost to be a, another civil war, uh, by a deal. Rutherford B. Hayes became the president. He promised he would only run, he would not run for re-election. Uh, the Democrats got control of the customs and treasury departments, which were the major sources of jobs at the time because the Civil Service Act had not been, yet been passed. And it was agreed that the federal government would withdraw troops from the South, effectively ending Reconstruction. National leaders had re reached a tacit understanding that race relations would be left up to the states. Now, unfortunately, neither the 14th nor 15th Amendments actually created a positive right to vote. The 14th Amendment doesn't mention voting at all, which left intact the basic rule that states determined who could vote. 
And the 15th is worded that any state may not abridge what voting rights had granted on the basis of race, color, previously considered condition of servitude, but doesn't state that there is a positive right of every citizen to vote. It merely says the right of citizens to vote shall not be abridged, which means if you have a right to vote, you, they can't abridge it. Now, the Supreme Court addressed this issue in 1874 in a case called Minor versus Happerset. I didn't include it on my list because I'm not going to go into the facts. But it made it clear that notwithstanding the 14th Amendment, there was no constitutionally established right to vote throughout the country, except to what the 15th Amendment said, that a state couldn't deprive the right to vote on the basis of race or color. Thus, what they did is they upheld a Missouri state law that limited voting to only adult males. Women sued to try and get the right to vote under the 14th Amendment, and the answer was, you don't get it. The Constitution, Section 1, Article 1, Section 2, gives each state the power to decide who may vote. Voting itself is not among the privileges and immunities promised to all citizens of the United States. Now, what followed over the next 20 years was the imposition of Jim Crow. And I think I can stop screen sharing here for a while. Uh, let me, uh, uh, here we go. There, there we go. Okay. Hello, everybody. <laughs> I can now see you. What followed over the next 20 years was the imposition of Jim Crow. Southern states passed laws that relegated Black Americans to second-class citizenship, including laws and practices designed to keep them from voting. They adopted literary tests, literacy tests that registrars were free to apply unevenly. They adopted grandfather clauses that allowed any adult male to vote whose father or grandfather was allowed to vote under state law in 1860. At that time, every state in the South said the Blacks couldn't vote. They adopted poll taxes, knowing that most bad Blacks couldn't pay them. And if all that didn't work, Blacks faced outright intimidation by threats and violence when threats seemed insufficient. Meanwhile, voting for everyone else expanded. During the late 19th century, Wyoming, Connecticut, Utah, and Idaho enfranchised women. Between 1910 and 1914, the height of the progressive movement, Washington, California, Arizona, Kansas, and Oregon, and Illinois did the same. And finally, the Wilson administration got on the program, and the 19th Amendment Enfranchising Women was passed by Congress in June 1919 and ratified as of August 1920. And that was close. It were, there, there were, they needed Tennessee as the last vote. If they didn't get Tennessee, it would fail. And Tennessee's legislature passed it by one vote. Uh, so it, it, even then, it was not easy. Uh, in California, interestingly enough, and I know this because I did the research on it, uh, in the same election uh, that California approved uh, the, the initiative and referendum by a vote of like 85% to 15%, it gave the women the vote by 51% to 49%. So it wasn't, you know, there was still a lot of opposition. It took World War II and Brown versus Topeka Board of Education, the, so, you know, the school desegregation case, for the federal government to begin to consider the need to do something about the South's denial of black voting rights. In 1956, safely reelected, the Eisenhower administration proposed federal legislation to do something about it. That was proposed in late 1956. But Southerners, whose seniority, you know, allowed them to chair the key congressional committees, watered down what became the Civil Rights Act of, 18, of 1957, so it merely created a short-lived commission to study the issue and make recommendations. Which brings us to the early 1960s. The Freedom Riders, the lunch counter sit-ins, Sheriff Bull Connor sicking attack dogs on peaceful demonstrators, many of whom were kids. I mean, we, this is when I was a kid, this is my childhood. This is what I, I my young adulthood. This is really very much in my, in my memory. It's why I don't teach 20th century history. It's too much current events. Uh, Kennedy spoke to the nation in June 1963, and for the first time, an American president publicly recognized the moral imperative of actually doing something to advance civil rights and put an end to Jim Crow. After Kennedy's assassination, Johnson got Kennedy's Civil Rights Act through Congress in June 1964, which ended segregation in state and local governments, public accommodations, and businesses open to the public. And that brings us to 1965. 
And this is a good time for questions because we've now done the history part. <laughs> so unmute yourselves. Let me hear from you. What do you think of all this? Okay, I'll ask one. I, I was surprised about the secret ballot history. So what what was done before and, and you said well, the 1880s? Initially, yeah, initially up until about the 1810 or up until the early 19th century, it was oral, believe it or not. You would go up to the chair and the registrar and the sheriff and the registrar of voters would be sitting there as well as the town, the, the town leaders. And you would identify yourself. They'd check you on a list as being eligible to vote. And you would say, okay, who do you vote for? And you'd tell them who you voted for. Then when they started using paper ballots, when that took too long, what they did is each party had its own ballot. And so the ballots were different colors. So everybody knew which ballot you were, 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 uh, were casting. Now, the, for this, this ballot, the idea that all ballots would look the same, actually first began in Australia, and it's called the Australian ballot. And it was not adopted unifiedly around the United States until the 1880s. There used to be party candidates, because a lot of, you know, there was still an issue of, of literacy. And so uh, you there would be a box and it would list the Democratic candidates and you would check that box. Uh, and that would be the Democratic Party's ballot or the Whig Party's ballot or the Republican Party's ballot or whatever. Uh, and you would vote the straight party ticket. And people, their political registration, you know, was almost like their religion. It was based on family. Uh, ninety percent of people, or not, over ninety percent of people who vote, who were members of a party, were generally members of the party that their fathers had belonged to. Uh, and so, uh, this really didn't change. This actually didn't change until the twentieth century, uh, until until the until the, the the depression era, and all of a sudden. You saw a lot of Repu progressive Republicans became Democrats, especially the educated and, and, and the Jews in the city. I mean, most Jews were Republicans up until up until the Wilson, up until the progressive era, uh, interestingly enough. So because that, that was the party of Lincoln. Uh, so that's that that's the history of it. it it's really interesting that uh, the secret ballot did came much later than we think. Yeah. I got a question for you. Yes, Lou. Why uh, I'm interested in the connection between the democratization of taxation, like moving from the property tax toward the income tax, how uh, participation and support of a uh, war against um, our enemies, like women and blacks, working in the services or in the factories, munitions factories, this sort of thing that has happened along with uh, voting rights. How would, how would those be connected? Well, that's a really interesting question. First off, it's interesting. You got to know that the income tax, other than for four years during three years during the Civil War, if the income tax was illegal because it was unconstitutional because Congress said that taxes shall be pro shall be uh, pro shall be prorated among the states based on population so that everybody's tax would be equal in a given state and it wasn't until the 20th amendment uh, pardon me the uh, the uh, 18th and uh, the 17th amendment no the 16th amendment which was uh, the Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes on incomes uh, that was approved in 1913. And it was actually, see, up until then, excise taxes were and, and imposed duties and excise taxes were the government's source of money. What were excise, what was the biggest source of excise taxes? Alcohol. Okay. <laughs> and it was the adoption of the income tax that allowed for prohibition because all of a sudden the government wouldn't be reliant on, on, on excise taxes on alcohol. And so the, the, the expansion of voting, the elimination of property requirements and tax requirements in the earlier 19th century had nothing to do with the income taxes. 
Income, that's a totally different issue. Income taxes didn't become legal till 1913. So I don't know, you know, other, otherwise, yeah, I think, you know, then, then you, you get to a different issue because remember the first conscription law other than the Civil War was in the connection with the entry into World War I. Conscription was eliminated as soon as World War I ended. It was reintroduced in 1940 in response to World War II, where Roosevelt realized what was coming and said we need to get, you know, in 1939, the U.S. Army had like 113,000 people for the entire army. So conscription came back in, in, 19, in early 1940 uh, as part of Roosevelt's rearmament. Uh, and then because of the Cold War, it continued until, until the Jimmy Carter era when it was finally eliminated. So yeah, now, now, now do you see the timeline is a little different than your question posed. It is, thank you. Anything else? Okay. Uh, uh, Susan had a question. Susan, yes, please. You're muted, Susan. Would you unmute yourself? Got, you got it, okay. When did women start agitating for the vote? When did they? Well, they first started in the 1830s. And That's 40s. what I thought you said. Yeah, Elizabeth Cady Stanton's Women's Rights Convention was in 1848 in Seneca Falls. Mm -hmm. If you've ever been there, there's a wonderful museum uh, in Seneca Falls celebrating that. Uh, there's a women's rights museum there. Didn't realize it was that early. Uh, and then. Uh, one of the things that I did, it, my dissertation was on state constitutional history. And part of, you know, if you, you've ever had to do a dissertation in, in something like history, you read a lot of really boring stuff, <laughs> including what I had to read from mine were the records of all the state constitutional conventions. And there were 170, over 175 of them, not counting the Civil War Reconstruction Conventions, whereas during the 19th century, states continuously were writing and rewriting their state constitutions. State constitutional conventions were almost a, a, a de facto fourth branch of government. There were so damn many of them. And in the Ohio, uh, in the Ohio uh, had a convention in 1849 and 1850, and there were numerous petitions by women asking them to, 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 to uh, allow voting, uh, women to vote. And that was constant throughout the end of the 19th century. In almost every state constitution, there were uh, pleas and petitions to allow women to vote. They were full- Within the states you're talking about. I'm sorry? Within the state law, but under the, the state, state constitution. Law. Yeah, in the state constitutions, not the federal constitution. Uh, and as I, in the West, which is where women voting first started, part of it was basically, hey, if we let women vote, maybe they'll be more likely to come here because we need more women. We have more men than women, our guys need to get married. <laughs> and that's why California, one of the delegates in California's 1849 convention, the strongest argument for adopting community property, not that it was already the law in California under Mexican law, but maybe women with property would come to the state because we need them. <laughs> uh, and so uh, the first, as I noted, the first women being allowed to vote were in the West. Uh, while, you know, and it started with school boards, uh, but then, uh, Wyoming, Connecticut, Utah, and Idaho were the first to actually enfranchise women in their state constitutions. Uh, Washington and Idaho came into the Union. There were six states that came into the Union in 1849, uh, mainly because the Republicans wanted more, more, more senators because <laughs> they figured they were, all, they were all Western states and they'd come in. So you had the Dakota Territory the, the divided in half, so you North and South Dakota. Uh, I think Molly Ivins had the had the had the state the right state motto for North Dakota, not as boring as South Dakota. <laughs> uh, uh, Montana, Washington, Idaho, and Wyoming. Well, those six states came in in, in eighteen uh, in, in, in eighteen eighty nine, and three of them allowed women to vote. Uh, and then the progressive movement had a huge influence on this. Uh, 
and allowed six more, and, and the other states that I mentioned, uh, uh, Washington, California, Arizona, Kansas, and Oregon, and Illinois all allowed, gave women the full vote in, in response to the progressive movement. Uh, so they could vote for up to, up to governor then, that was the highest office they could vote for. No, they, they were allowed to vote in everything. They were included, in step, once you were allowed to vote for the lowest member of the state legislature, meant you could vote in federal elections. So uh, being able to vote for in federal elections was dependent on if you could vote for the lowest house in your state, in your state assembly, you could vote in federal elections. Now, because in con under the constitution, the first, the, the, uh, the uh, only the House was democratically elected. When Congress made uh, senators, I mean, when senators were made democratically elected by the uh, 17th Amendment, which took effect in 1913, uh, the Senate of the United States shall be composed of two senators in each state, elected by the people thereof for six years, and each senator shall have one vote. The electors in each state shall have the qualifications requisite for the electors in the most numerous branch of the state legislature, parroting the language in Article mm -hmm. 1, Section 2. So that the idea that you could vote in federal elections, provided you could vote for the lowest mm -hmm. member of the House in state elections. And interestingly enough, states never other by almost by 1810, 1820, uh, states didn't distinguish who could vote for which state offices. If you could vote for one state office, you could vote for all, uh, became the rule. Thank you. Uh, there's a marvelous book and I don't, I think I put it on the list uh, uh, of recommended votes. Yeah, it's Alexander Keyser, The Right to Vote, The Contested History of Democracy in the United States. And, uh, Here's what it looks like. Uh, I found a used copy hardback on, on the line for about eight bucks. And it really gives you the contested history of democracy in the United States. It's, it's really a very thorough discussion uh, of the right to vote uh, through, 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 through 2000. Uh, and it's, a, it's a very good book. I highly recommend it. Uh, anything else? Other questions? Yes. Uh, Janet, unmute yourself, Janet. Is, do you see uh, um, an interplay between voting and the push for public universal education? Uh, well, right, yeah, I would say yeah, there's a connection in the, in the sense that the people who are most in favor of everybody voting are also most of the uh, people who are who are for public education, you know, public education are generally more liberal and therefore would also support the right, you know, expanding voting rights, the, the greatest possible expansion of voting rights. Uh, the public education movement in the United States is another issue. It really, again, it's a 19th century thing that came about. Part of it was to combat uh, the influence of, of parochial schools. Uh, secondly, uh, and it was, by the way, resistant in the South for much of the South for the same, for, 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 for many reasons. One, uh, they didn't want to provide, they wanted to, they didn't want to spend money for it. Uh, uh, and uni universal public education uh, grew in the progressive era uh, and is, again, in the 20th century has been deemed a matter of right. I think that's about as close as I can say. I don't, I'm not sure there's a real strong linkage there. Although the, pe the people who are for one are also generally for the other. But I think that has to do with their predilections, their political slant as much as anything else. Uh, Barry, shall we take a five minute biological break? Sounds good of modifications and extensions, most recently in, 19, in 2006. But the 1965 version and each later amendment was supported by congressional findings supported by documentation of past and on, ongoing discriminatory practices. 
And two parts of the Voting Rights Act are critical and are at, at issue. And I'm going to put them up here. Uh, here. And here they are. The first is Section 2, which mirrors the language of the 15th Amendment. No voting qualification or prerequisites to voting or standard practice or procedure shall be imposed or applied by any state or political subdivision to deny or abridge the right of any citizen of the United States to vote on account of race or color. Its definitions, which I didn't put up here because there's too many of them, make it clear that it bans any law, practice, or procedure that has a discriminatory purpose or a discriminatory effect or which results in a, a diminishment of the right to vote or to elect representatives of one choice on account of race or color. There is language in it that makes it clear that there's no entitlement to proportional representation per se, but otherwise it's pretty broad. broad. It applies nas nationwide and allows enforcement in federal court and it has no expiration date. Then sections four and section five contains the pre-clearance requirement. In certain jurisdictions with a history of racially discriminatory voting laws and practices, no new law practice or procedure involving voting or elections may go into effect unless it's pre-cleared by the Department of Justice or allowed by the federal court in Washington, DC. And that's what all this ver ver verbiage on the right hand side actually says. It says basically you have to get the you have to get permission from the district court to allow it to go into effect, but you don't have to go to the court as long as the Department of Justice says it's okay. That's called that's the pre-clearance provision. It applies to any state, county, city, or other voting district that used a literacy or other test as of November 1. 1964, and either had fewer than 50% turnout of eligible voters in the 1964 presidential election, which is later amended to include the 68 and 72 elections, or had less than 50% of otherwise eligible adults registered to vote. Uh, the, the section four, which I didn't put up here because it's two pages long, lists all the different uh, eligible uh, uh, standards and practices that would cause a state a, or a local district uh, to be covered. And by covered by a, a district would be included if it had the responsibility of registering voters. So that meant any state, but some cities had separate registrations or some districts had separate registration uh, requirements. So that's where it came up. When passed in, in 1965, the pre-clearance requirement was to expire in five years. It was extended for seven years in 1970. In 1975, they extended it for 19 years. And in 2006, they extended it to, for 35 years in 2032. As of 2006, pre-clearance applied to nine states. All of them were in the South and specific counties or districts in 13 other states. Parts of New York were included because of a history of discriminating against Puerto Rican voters who, were, who, who didn't speak English. Uh, and I'm not gonna go into that in this lecture because I just, I just don't have time, but it's, part, it's an interesting part of it. And part of the litigation over this, in, 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 over the Civil Rights Act and the extensions of it were to require uh, voting materials to be in, in different languages. In 1966, in South Carolina versus Katzenbach, and I can stop screen sharing because I don't think I have another slide for a while. The, 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 the Voting Rights Act came before the Supreme Court in 1966 in South Carolina versus Katzenbach. Nicholas Katzenbach was the attorney general in South Carolina and a whole number of other states and jurisdictions sued. They were all consolidated for argument. And the Supreme Court upheld the preclearance provisions eight to one. This is during the, uh, during the Warren years. Only Justice Black dissented 
from that portion of the opinion that approved preclearance because he felt the Constitution simply did not allow Congress to ever require states to get federal approval of state laws that, that were ostensibly within the purview of state authority because he knew that the Constitutional Convention had expressly rejected that idea. He felt this went too far, but he would vote the rest of the bill. The remainder of the Voting Rights Act was upheld nine to zero. Chief Justice Warren's opinion held that because the 14th and 15th Amendments granted Congress the right to uh, the power to enforce them, the exercise of that power will be upheld if Congress uses, quote, any rational means, close quote, to address race-based race -based voter discrimination. And the history of the discrimination that was laid out in the congressional record amplified, amply justified the preclearance provisions. Now, South Carolina argued that the act was contrary to the equal sovereignty rule. This is a rule that, that, that implies that all states are entitled to be treated equally. You can't have a law that treats one state differently than another. But in response, the court held that this equal sovereignty rule only meant that all states were deemed equal members of the union when they were admitted, because the one case that had come up on this issue had been a situation where a law was passed in the early 20th century that looked forward to admitting uh, Oklahoma, Arizona, and New Mexico to the union. And the law provided that Oklahoma could not change its state capital for a period of 10 years. And it didn't say anything about the state capital of the other territories. And the court held that that rule violated the equal sovereignty rule. Uh, so that was, that was the basis of this equal sovereignty idea. But Justice Warren, the court nine to zero, argued that that rule only applies when states are admitted. That it did not apply where provisions of a federal law that had nothing to do with the states joining the union, but it applied to some states and not others based on identified facts and circumstances that weren't shared by all, that then it's okay. That, cert that in our different states, we have diff different rules. We have different, ex we different situations that develop and sometimes the federal law is gonna apply to one state and not another based on that. This is okay. And for the next 40 years, the Voting Rights Act was generally accepted as given. Many and many hundreds of proposed state and local rules failed to pass, pass preclearance. This comes up in, in the dissent in, in, the, in, the Shelby, uh, in the Shelby uh, County case. <clears throat> so there were a number of cases after Katzenbach versus South Carolina, or South Carolina versus Katzenbach that dealt with it. And none of them really Took a took gave it a hit or, or or attacked it at all until 2008 uh, in a case called Crawford versus Marion County Election Board. It was a harbinger of the Supreme Court's changing attitude towards the Voting Rights Amendment because this is 2008. The court has substantially changed, and, and in Crawford, a six-three divided court found that Indiana's new voter identification law didn't violate the Voting Rights Act. Indiana had, Indiana had passed a law that required people showing up to vote had to have a state issued ID. Justices Thomas and Scalia felt that the Voting Rights Act should apply only when a state or local rule imposes a major impediment to voting on the basis of race or color. Otherwise they said the whole Voting Rights Act should go out. Justice Stevens, who was joined by Roberts and Alito, found that having to obtain an ID card under the facts of the case was not an unreasonable burden. They were free, they were easy to get, and having to take documents, including a birth certificate or a passport to a local DMV office to get an ID was acceptable. And a person who didn't have an ID card could cast a provisional ballot that would be counted if within 10 days that person went to the county clerk's office and signed an affidavit or that, that they couldn't get a birth certificate. And that's the case because many people, not, not everybody, especially people who are elderly in the 19, you know, who are elderly, always have birth certificates, especially in, in, in the minority communities. Babies are born at home. Uh, in many jurisdictions, records were lost because of fires. And you, I know that in some states, 
my dad went to get a birth certificate and basically he got a certificate from the court in New Jersey that the records of that county were destroyed in a fire. And by all, for all intents and purposes, it appears that he was born on such and such a date in such and such a town. And he was able to get a passport on it. So they did provide a means for people to get to, to, get to, to, to vote if they couldn't have a birth certificate. But the, and the Supreme Court noted that there was no evidence in the trial court. Now remember, when a case gets to the Supreme Court, there's always a trial first. It doesn't, rarely gets there based on pleadings. There's usually a court hearing in the district court where evidence is put on, the district court makes findings of facts, and the Supreme Court then relies on those findings in, in its rulings. And in this case, the Supreme Court noted that there was no evidence of how many people didn't try to vote for lack of an ID card or what percentage of them were minorities. And they also noted that a fact that because a number of legislatures have had a partisan interest in passing the law was no basis for overturning it where the plaintiff couldn't prove that the law had a discriminatory effect. And because the, 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 the record in the court below was very minor. The dissent, which was Justices Souter, Breyer, and Ginsburg in 2008, argued that the, the Indiana's ID rule should fall. They said that the steps necessary to obtain an ID card or verify why a person didn't have one were burdensome. The provisional ballot remedy was meaningless. And they, only three of 34 people who cast provisional ballots in a recent election actually bothered to go and fill out the affidavit to get their ballots counted. And they also noted that no ID was required to vote by absentee ballot under Indiana law. They, it only applied if you showed up. Uh, and there was no evidence of any historical basis for fearing election fraud. Well, that brings us to Shelby County versus Holder, the main, the main topic for today. It was decided in 2013, five to four. And the Supreme Court agreed with Shelby County that pre, the pre-clearance requirement was unconstitutional. The opinion was written by Chief Justice Roberts, joined by Scalia, Thomas, Kennedy, and Alito, and it made the following points. First, the Congress contains the basic rule that elections are controlled by state law, subject to the 14th, 15th, and 19th Amendments, etc. In other words, that uh, it's, it's up to state law, that's, that's the rule, but it can't discriminate on the basis of color, race, or servitude, on the basis of sex, or on the basis of age if you're over 18. Secondly, any departure from this basic rule imposing a condition for a state law or local regulation to take effect must be because there is a current problem to be fixed. That if there isn't a current problem, it violates the Constitution. And I've stressed the word current because they put it in, I, in uh, they underline it, I put it in italics. It was that, that you have a basic rule and if you're gonna, if you're gonna depart from that rule, there must be a current problem to be fixed. In 1965, discrimination against blacks across the South would continue unabated unless redressed. That was a given. Thus, at that time, the preclearance provisions were supported by then current conditions. So now in 2013, the preclearance requirement in the Voting Rights Act was an uncommon exercise of congressional power. It's uncommon because it was the first time that any, that the states were ever required to get preclearance other than during reconstruction. It imposed burdens on some states and not others. And it did so in areas that the constitution reserved to the states, namely who could vote. As such, the equal to sovereignty rule requires that any deviation must be justified by exceptional circumstances. This extension of the equal sovereignty rule was new, as it was known in the dissenting opinion. Uh, the Supreme Court had previously held the equal sovereignty rule only applies where states are being admitted to the union. It has nothing to do with laws that have nothing to do with their admission. That was what Katzenbach decided. Now the Supreme Court saying, no, that's not the rule. The equal sovereignty rule exists. And if you're gonna deviate from it, there must be exceptional circumstances. That's creating something new. The next thing that the, the, the opinion points out 
is that in, in, in 2012, although it, it's two, in 2012, the pre-clearance formulas laid out in section four of the act were based on mostly pre-1965 practices. And the Voting Rights Act's registration and voter turnout standards remain pegged to the 1972 election. But a half century passed and circumstances have changed. And the opinion notes that in 2004, the percentage of eligible Blacks registered to vote across the South were roughly equal to that of whites. And it listed all the states and the amount of, and, and the registration rates and, and the census rates, citing the number of Blacks registered in two, 1966 and then 2004. And they're basically right. The, turn, the, the registration rate for whites and Blacks across the South were roughly equal. Turnout in most recent presidential elections in districts and states required to get pre-clearance was on parity with turnout across the nation. In other words, you weren't seeing that turnout in Mississippi or Alabama or Georgia or in any of the other counties was appreciably different than turnout in New York, Massachusetts, or California. They note that minority candidates held office at unprecedented levels noting President Obama's election. And they noted that blatant discriminatory violations are rare. And so they argued that thus the pre-clearance provisions are no longer supported by current conditions. And they also note that when Congress did its 25 year reauthorization in 2006, it wasn't supported by current progressive or flagrant or widespread discrimination which was anything close to what had existed in 1965. And without findings that a need for pre-clearance is supported by current condition, indicating risks of continuing voting discrimination on the basis of race or color, the pre-clearance provisions in the Voting Rights Act were unconstitutional. So it's unconstitutional because you don't can't subject state laws to pre-clearance. It's that's not included in the federal, in the delegated powers in Article I. And they aren't necessary to enforce the 15th Amendment because overt discrimination in voting based on race or color is in the past, or so they said. So that's what the case holds. Uh, the decision is about, about 25 pages long. I've reduced it to a page and a half, but those are its main points. So let's get to the dissent written by Justice Ginsburg, joined by Justices Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan. Like many dissents, it seems written in the hopes that a different court revisiting the issue might decide differently, or that it will point out that this decision is so egregious that the political branches of government are gonna do something about it. And depending on one point, one's point of view, it tore holes in the majority's arguments, very big holes in my opinion. She notes that the preclearance rules have a dual purpose to continue gains in eliminating voting and election discrimination on the basis of racist color and to prevent backsliding. She argues that when Congress found that voting discrimination remained an issue when it reauthorized and extended the Voting Rights Act in 2006, that it, she noted that from 1982 to 2006, the Department of Justice blocked some 700, 700 voting changes under preclearance rules. So 700 different changes were thrown out by the Justice Department and not reinstated. So there, there, is a, there is still a continued need. The variety and persistence of new methods aimed at undermining the power of black voters as soon as an existing method is struck down is like a multi-headed hydrate, cut off one head and two more grow back. So, so she's arguing that Pre-clearance is still ne necessary. Discrimination and violation of the 15th Amendment will continue and would continue were it not for the pre-clearance provisions. That the, the, the act's success is no reason to kill it. If something works, don't get rid of it because it works. That's, that's insane logic. That we find that this works, so we're gonna end it. That's, that's insanity. Just because a vaccine works, you don't stop getting vaccinated. <laughs> she argued that in 2006, just as in 1990, 1965, case-by-case -case litigation to enforce Section 2 is inadequate. 
it takes too long. It costs too much money. It's too complex to file a case. Adduce the necessary statistical evidence and take the case through trial and appeals. And when you are suing under Section 2, the objector has to prove discrimination. The, what they call the risk of non-persuasion, the idea that you're not going to be able to convince somebody that you're right, it falls on the plaintiff, the person trying to say this law is improper. Under pre-clearance, that risk of nine, the, the Voting Rights Act shifted the risk of non-persuasion from the individual voters to the states themselves. So the states under pre-clearance had to justify that this provision is not going to do this. So they, uh, that's that's why this why why case by case litigation wasn't effective. It wasn't effective before the Voting Rights Act, and it's not going to be effective after after the Supreme Court kills kills preclearance. And Congress considered both the current realities and the historical record when it passed the 2006 reauthorization bill. And she noted that it passed in the House 390 to 33 and 98 to nothing in the Senate. So she correctly noted correctly, in my view, that the majority's equal sovereignty argument effectively changes the law overruling South Carolina versus Katzenbach. And longstanding precedents shouldn't be overruled on the cuff. That's the worst kind of judicial activism. But there's more. I think you get her drift. The majority is wrong on the facts, wrong on the law, and it results in a broad, important, broadly supported law that's really needed being struck down because simply because five judges don't like it. Uh, the decision reduced the Voting Rights Act to banning specific practices that weren't used anymore. Section 2's general ban on discriminatory practices enforceable only through case-by-case -case litigation is a joke. It doesn't work. So that is the that is this case. That that is the the the, the, the case. Uh, before I get into more, are there any questions? Do I need to repeat any of that? Did you get it all? Because there's a lot of ideas there, and there's a lot of distinctions that I think are important. Are there any questions? Do we, anybody need me to repeat anything? It's not going to be on the exam. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, well, I I have one, Arthur. Do I understand correctly, you, you said that uh, the pre-clearance provision applies to states that um, that fall under certain certain measurable uh, former practices. Is that, that right? That's correct. I mean, so, so were the states that were under the pre-clearance provision still failing to get out of this status of well, th that's what the court, that's, that was the main argument the court is making, that, yeah. to, to, that the, what the Voting Rights Act does is, you know, it keeps extending preclearance, which means that you're being constantly punished for sins that were committed a long time ago. You're not committing those sins now. That, that's their argument, that these states, that the basic rule is states are allowed to decide who gets to vote. That's, that's what the Constitution says, but you can't deny them the vote on the basis of race or color. You can't deny them. You, can, you can't deny uh, on the basis of sex, and you can't deny it on the basis of age if they're over 18. But of, other than those requirements, that the state that that who can vote is up to the states. If if the states allow you to vote in the state elections for the lowest member of the house, you're you're allowed to vote in federal elections. That's the constitutional rule. And unless you change the Constitution, that remains the rule. That's the argument they've made. And for a state to be put in a category that says, no, you can't, you have to get your rules changed based on what you did in the past, that in effect, that never expires, that's wrong. That's what they're saying. What Ginsburg is saying is, that, yeah, you might think that, except that the fact that they have continued to try and pull the wool over our eyes, that over seven, that some 700 rules have been struck down because they violate, because they, they have the discriminatory effect, shows that you're still trying to get away with this just under different ways of doing it. Just because the law doesn't appear, if you're careful enough to craft a law that it only applies to this part of your population, although it doesn't say that, 
but because of the other ways that it's, it's defined, such as the way your districts are set up, or that you have a single district, that you have a block voting, you don't have block voting for school boards and stuff like that to dilute minority votes. Uh, and all the, or that you, you put in these uh, requirements that it's a crime to give somebody water while they're standing in line. Would you know that the lines to vote in the minority areas are 10 times as long and it's really hot? Uh, that, that they, they keep trying to, to discriminate and we keep throwing their, their rules out. And that alone is justification for continuing this. And that's, that's where the division is. Once, once you sin, you're always a sinner because we know that you're going to keep trying to sin. You, you, you follow what I'm saying, Barry? Yes. Yeah. And so it's, it's not an easy issue. I, I can understand when you read this, you say, well, yeah, that was 50 years ago. You shouldn't be tied to it forever. A state shouldn't be in the, you know, you, you, you don't leave your kids in the doghouse because they stole, they stole a candy bar from the, from the store when they were seven and now they're 17. Uh, and and that, you, that's what the court is saying. And after all, it's changed. You know, we've got black governors. We got black, we had a black president for goodness sake. I mean, you're throwing a cheap, a, what I consider a very cheap shot. When in fact, there is still insidious, there is insidious racism in, in, in all aspects of our society and in voting as well. And it comes, to, and if you don't stop it, it's gonna continue. Uh, and, we, but the answer, you know, and, and unfortunately, I think the answer is you gotta have a federal right to vote. Mm -hmm. until, until you change the constitution and make it a federal universal right to vote for, it, for, for, any, for any adult citizen over the age of 18 throughout the United States and have it even, you're, 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 this problem is never gonna go away. But as long as the states are free to, 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 to administer it, that we have this dual federalism, unless you change this by constitutional amendment, you're stuck with it. Lou had a question. Yeah. Yeah, I'm wondering uh, if you could tell us of perhaps uh, an empirical study that shows the extent to which throwing out preclearance has indeed affected voting in certain states like Texas or Mississippi or one of your choice. Actually, there is a there, there that is being done. Uh, there's an organization called the Brenner, the Brenner, named after Justice Brenner, uh, the Brenner Center for Law and uh, for, for Law and Justice. It's a uh, Brenner, B R E N N, Brennan, B R E N N A N Center.org. And I've got a slide on this at the very end where it does come up. So, yes, that there is work being done in this area. How effective it's going to be, I don't know, because this is all relatively new. Uh, you know, 2013 is, is, you know, it's only eight, it's eight years ago, but, it, but it, in, in legal terms, that's short. Mm -hmm. uh, but, 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 but there's more. And so are there any, let me go on and finish because your question it directly relates, Lou, to, to, to what I've got for the next, the last bit of my lecture. I, I'm almost at the end, but this past March in Brnovich, B-R-N-O-V-I-C-H versus Democratic National Committee that was decided just in March, it's a six to three majority, took the teeth out of section two. In 2016, Arizona made two changes to their voting procedures. One was a rule that any ballot cast in the wrong precinct on election day wouldn't be counted. Many Arizona counties had switched to using countywide voting centers rather than individual precincts. And this new rule only applied in counties that retained the precinct system. However, Mariposa County, the biggest county in Arizona was one of them. The second involved mail-in voting. Arizona voters may request an early ballot to be mailed or hand delivered to a voting center during the 27 days before election day. And they don't need to have an excuse for it. In that sense, it's, it's almost like California used to be. Uh, 
The new rule, though, made it a crime for anyone other than a postal employee, an election official, the voter, or a voter's family member or caretaker to, quote, knowingly collect an earlier ballot either before or after it was completed. Now, what had happened is the Democratic National Committee was in the habit, they had gone door to door in minority districts to uh, get out the boat drive to help people yeah, to, to, record, to suggest people get their ballots, you know, and be, especially on the Indian reservations where there's very few mailboxes, they offered, and we'll take the ballots and turn them in for you. And the, the Republican-led legislature reacted to this uh, and was trying to eliminate it. Now, the Democratic National League Committee sued in the federal court in Arizona, claimed that both provisions violated Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act because each rule had an, ad, an adverse and disparate effect on Native American, Hispanic, and Black voters. Also, the, the Democratic National Committee claimed that the rules were adopted with discriminatory intent, and as such, they violated Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, can you guess which way it turned out? <laughs> Justice Alito wrote the opinion. Do you need any more hints? He was joined by Roberts, Thomas, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett, uh, the happy six, noted that this was the first case, and they're right, to consider Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act in the context of laws, laws and regulations concerning time, place, and manner of voting, not on who could vote or what you were voting for, but time, place, and manner of voting. This is the first Supreme Court case to ever consider this. And considering who are the majority, I'm not surprised they upheld the Arizona rules. Now, the majority opinion came down to answer how they answered a question. And I'm going to give you the question. I, this is what I pulled out of the, uh, the opinion. Taking into account the totality of the circumstances, did the Democratic National League Committee prove that the process was not equally open such that minorities had less opportunity than others to participate and to elect representatives of their choice? That's the question. And I think framing the question that way is, a, is under the law an appropriate way of doing it. Taking into account all the circumstances, did the Democratic National Committee prove that the process was not equally open such that minorities had less opportunity than others to participate and to elect representatives of their choice? And based on the facts found true by the trial court, they answered no. And here's the points they made. They made six points. First, the rules applied equally to all voters and did not impose burdens any greater than those traditionally associated with voting. And I think you're probably right there that we've always been required to know where you're supposed to vote. And votes are cast in the wrong place were usually accepted provisionally and there had to be a reason for it. Secondly, the vast majority of voters mailed in ballots without the assistance of third parties not in their households. And that's true. This probably only applies to less than two or three percent of, 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 of voters in the state, although it applied to a much larger percentage of minority voters. There was no evidence of how many minority voters rely, relied on third party or mail to deliver their ballots. That's true. There wasn't any evidence put in, in, in the lower court on this issue because it's almost impossible to measure. The only way you can measure it is to know how many voters, how many, how many mail-in voters there were overall, and then how many were turned in differently. You know how many you, your national committee may have turned in, but you don't know how many other voters were turned in, how many, how many times uh, a next door neighbor may have done it or something like that. There's just no evidence. And so the evidence supported the trial judge's findings that the legislative intent was to present the possibility of fraud in ballot collecting. And that some legislatures may have had a partisan motivation doesn't mean their motivation is racial. In other words, trying to suppress Democratic votes doesn't mean you're necessarily trying to suppress Black votes. And voting has traditionally imposed burdens such as having to register, to travel to a polling place, to wait in line, to sign a book, to follow instructions, to fill out a ballot or use a machine, and travel back home to your place of employment. So adding a slight additional burden is not discriminate, that is not discriminatory on its face was not necessarily improper. 
And in Arizona's 2018 election, the court is noting that, which is the first to be held under these rules, over 98% of all in-person ballots were counted. And although about 1% of minority ballots were not counted, and about one half of 1% of non-minority ballots were not counted, the overall impact was negligible. So Arizona's rules didn't violate section two. They did not constitute a voting qualification procedure, standard practice or practice imposed or implied that results in denial or abridgment of the right to vote and elect candidates on the choice on the basis of race or color. And the opinion noted that when determining, when you're applying a rule's impact on a minority, and these are time, place, and manner rules, the size of any disparity is assessed taking into account the totality of circumstances. Because the Constitution provides that voting is mostly regulated by the states and not the federal government, the state doesn't have to show that the rules at issue were necessary to protect the state interest, only that there's a reasonable connection. Thus, Section 2 is not violated when a time, place, or manner rule is neutral on its face, has a negligible or slight impact, and is reasonably related to the state's interest. To hold otherwise would essentially federalize all voting rules, which is not in the Constitution, and it's not the intent of the Voting Rights Act. They make a, a or the 15th or 19th or 26th Amendments, which all frame the language in a way that preserves the basic rule of the Constitution that voting uh, the voting is to be regulated and run by the states. The dissent by Justices Kagan, Breyer, and Sotomayor, the three wise people who are left, <laughs> pardon me, <laughs> charged the majority with improperly, improperly uh, pulling whatever teeth remained in the Voting Rights Act after they improperly held unconstitutional the voting rights preclearance provisions. They argued that instead of interpreting the Voting Rights Act broadly, which is what Congress intended, the majority has crafted standards for assessing voter suppression laws that is almost impossible to overcome. The dissent noted that mail collection points on Indian reservations and in outlying rural areas were few and far between, and the rules had a major deterrent impact on minorities living on reservations in rural areas, especially those who lacked ready transportation, which in those areas is more than in others. And she noted that while the actual numbers of uncounted ballots cast in the wrong precinct may be small, the impact on minority voters compared to non-minority voters was large, doubled it, which in a close election could actually make the difference. Now it's easy to see the impact of the two cases. And I'm gonna go back to screen, screen sharing here. Look at the, 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 this map shows states with new restrictive laws and states with new expansive laws. Uh, you guys can see, I can see this entirely. I've got all your pictures on the right-hand side of my screen, so and I can't change the size of that, but you guys can see this. And you can see that it's basically the red states that have restrictive laws, the blue states are expansive laws. And there are a few states that are, that are, that are shown on both maps. And these are states that have, that have actually done both ways. And usually if, if you, and as a result of the pandemic, if you make it easier to get a mail-in ballot, uh, you've expand you've 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 ex expanded voting. But if you've then limited the ability of a nonpartisan voting bureau to to, to 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 do the counting, you've restricted. And you notice that Louisiana's in both categories, uh, Illinois, in, pardon me, Indiana and Kentucky are in both categories. As it, and I think Vermont's in both too. Uh, as is Montana, as in both. But otherwise, you can, uh, and Nevada's, uh, and uh, Nevada's in both. But otherwise, you can see that it's basically, it's a division. And we can only hope that the expansive laws are going to 
uh, are, are going to counter it, but it probably won't because of the way the minorities, the way our, our voting is skewed to favor minority, the, the, the more rural states, which are more the, more the red states. The most populous states are the, the liberal states, the East Coast and the West Coast, and they, they are because of our, uh, our, our uh, gerrymandering provisions and, and the Senate, which is totally non-democratic. Uh, they're screwed, pardon me. Meanwhile, on October 20th, the Senate failed to find 60 votes of senators willing to even debate the House vote passing reform bill. All 50 Republicans voted not to allow the bill to even come up for the vote, and there we are. Mm -hmm. uh, as I said, it's not pretty. Mm -hmm. uh, and in, in my opinion, this is, this is of the reality that we face. And unless it, something happens that uh, uh, it changes, it's, it's going to be hard to get change. Um, and there we are. And I finished. I've got plenty of time for questions. So uh, going back to where we stood in the very beginning, the floor is open. You know, if you're all depressed as I am by this situation. <laughs> do we expand the Supreme Court? <laughs> no. Do we do away with the filibuster? Be, you know, every, every, for every action, there's an unintended consequence. And be careful of what you ask for because you'll get the unintended consequences. Uh, I think about removing the filibuster to get the Voting Rights Act through this Congress. But you remove the filibuster and the Republicans regain control of the House and the Senate and the Democrats lose the ability to, 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 to stop anything. Uh, you expand the court. Where does it still, you know, where does it, where, where does it, where does it, where does it go? Uh, and I, uh, last time I think there was a question as how we got to nine. And I think I answered that. If it needs me to go through it again, I, I can, but... Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. go first again. So this is slightly slightly off, but related. Is so? What is the current law on the gerrymandering issue? I mean, that in a way is one of the things that's most under you know, kind of undermining the democratic procedure in a way. And you have all these states in which, say, sixty percent of the people voted for. Uh, a legislator of one party, but that party only controls 35% of the votes. I mean, those, I, I well, they are, they, 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 that party control majority, minority, the Republic in, in certain states where, an example was San Antonio, Texas, uh, which for many years was a democratic voting, or Austin, Texas, was a democratic voting area, but, but four of the five congressmen who represented parts of that area were Republicans because what they did is they basically made a pie thing with little points coming into San Antonio to split mm -hmm. the vote out and, and dilute it with minority districts. And the court had, had held previously that, that partisan, that that politics are partisan and the court was not going to interfere with gerrymandering uh, that was a result of purely partisan uh, decisions, that there was no right, that there was no violation of the Constitution for the party in power to gerrymander in, 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 to, 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 to card districts that favored them as long as they weren't doing it in a way that, that uh, where the, where the impacted a, min a racial minority uh, where it had a disparate effect on racial, primarily affecting racial minorities. Mm -hmm. uh, and then white voters said, yeah, but then you're drawing, you're drawing, you're, 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 you're drawing uh, districts that are uh, uh, that, that are uh, you're drawing districts that are discriminating against white people by putting us in districts that are primarily minority districts, and we're we're being discriminated against in situation in, in, in what they call majority minority districts or minority majority districts, and the Supreme Court has wrestled with these. Uh, I I quite frankly 
I didn't go into it because it's another 10 cases in an hour and a half mm -hmm. to, try to, 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 to try and explain it. The answer is it's a mishmash. What they have done is they have said that even though uh, apportionment is left to the legislatures of the, of the several states, uh, they said that if legis state legislatures or the people through the initiative and referendum process decide to appoint nonpartisan commissions to gerrymand to, to, to draw districts, that's okay. So California's and those states have, have done it. Unfortunately, the states that have done it are essentially states that are mostly democratic. And the result is, so what happens is you get a lot of states with democratic majorities that are having their districts created basically on a nonpartisan basis. And the Republican states are, 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 are free to gerrymander their districts on a partisan basis because they're deciding not to go to nonpartisan uh, district drawing. And that's had an effect on it. Uh, so is California making a mistake because if, if, if Texas is going to gerrymander their district to screw the Democrats, should we gerrymander our districts to screw <laughs> the Republicans? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, go. I just, uh, I'm just looking for a little clarification uh, here. Uh, I think it's probably true from what you say that um, all of the laws about voting rights, um, use the terms race in there. Um, but you and I talk about minorities a lot. And we know that the, what has formerly been minorities in some states like Arizona and California have become majorities. And That's so true. I'm wondering if there is a possibility that there are laws that are framed in terms of minority and majority to protect the minority. Um, are these laws going to be used in the future to uh, cause, uh, to change in, in reverse of what they have been used in the past? The, the Supreme Court has interpreted the, the 15th Amendment and the 14th Amendment uh, uh, to, to mean race or color is minority. So you have language, so the Supreme Court and, and Congress and Congress in the Voting Rights Act, those portions of it that remain in effect, uh, deal with minority, use, my, use minority, the, the term inclusive, to use it inclusively. Uh, many people would argue that Hispanic is not a uh, Latina, Latino, Latina, Latinx, I, I, I'm not sure what, what the correct uh, uh, designation is now is not race, but it is a minority, or a, it is a it is a discernible in some areas. It is a minority uh, in some areas. It's it's a it's a language speaking minority uh, primarily, it, uh, and and you have and, and you have the Asian issues issues. And, you know, what do we consider Asian? Does that include is South Asian or East Asian? You know, you have Chinese, Japanese, what we consider Oriental, and then you have South Asian, Indian, you know, and color is such a permeable question, is such a permeable, uh, permeable qualification. Uh, you know, this country uh, for many years in many states tried to apply it on, you know, the one drop rule which was the rule in many Southern states that you had to prove back to great grandparent level that there were, you know, that everybody was pure white, but it's, I mean, racism is a, is a, is a permeable definition. Uh, I, I'm, I love uh, that show, Finding Your Roots. Mm -hmm. And you see, you know, and you see, as you go through back, you see that there are, that these are, per, these are permeable, uh, uh, they're, 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 they're not black and white, uh, they're not sharp line distinctions. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think there is, there is an issue. You know, I think the Constitution needs to be amended in a number of ways. I'm deathly afraid of a constitutional convention. Because uh, that's going to bring out every Yahoo, and who knows what's going to happen. And you know, you could end up with with with, with something much worse than what we have, and probably would. But on the other hand, there, 
you know, are you ever going to get two thirds of the Congress and three fourths of the states going to agree to reforms that are essentially going to reduce the power, the excessive power that certain minority, certain underpopulated areas of the country enjoy? Mm -hmm. I just don't think that's ever going to happen. Uh, I'm not sure how it, how it's ever going to happen. Uh, uh, in this in this kind of a situation, and I'm not sure. I don't know what the answer is. I think you know the answer is obviously you need to have voting made a national right. It has to be. There should be national uniformity on voting. The distinctions in, in states and areas made difference because there were substantial differences between them. You know when the country was founded and it lasted for a period of time, and the idea that that that. But we fought a civil war over this, and they lost. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Losing should have consequences. The idea that the United States is a singular noun should be a singular noun with me with meaning. But then again, I'm me. Uh, most people, a lot of people in different parts of the country, would very strongly disagree with me. Okay, uh, next time we're going to talk about religion. Uh, <laughs> something else on which we're all agreed. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, thank you very much, Arthur. Okay. Uh, uh, I hope it was understandable. I hope it was worth your time. Thank you all for appearing. Uh, and I will see you next week. <laughs>